they would have been the 62nd birthday of Mike Kelly, whose work spanned more than three decades and has been exhibited and collected all over the world. He collaborated with artists, musicians, performers. He was a teacher, a critical writer, and continues to influence countless artists of many generations. Uh, we are very lucky to have Laura Lopez Paniagua uh, here who completed her PhD on Kelly in 2015. Um, she's also a guest lecturer at uh, Loifana in Lüneburg um, and has contributed an almost surgical look into the seminal work of Kelly, which touches on memory, history, utopianism, materialism, just to name a few subjects and territories of his work. Um, without further ado, please welcome Laura Lopez Paniagua. It's been a real pleasure to work with you. Thanks for having me. And also thanks to all the team here at BART, made it really easy. Um, so, um, yeah, I would like to know, I mean, I see you, maybe you don't know that I see you, but I see you. How many students do we have here? Can you raise your hands? Okay, I think it's great that uh, so many students are here because uh, I think that uh, the real influence of an artist is probably better seen or great indicator for uh, an artist's influence is uh, how much he's able to uh, to be a part of the work of uh, other artists and especially of artists of a younger generation like yourselves. So uh, it makes me very very happy that you're here and. Um, yeah, so how many of you know the Educational Complex? Also raise your hands. Okay, so uh, if you don't know the Educational Complex, don't worry, because uh, after today, uh, you will. <laughs> so uh, I think it, it was like a year ago that uh, John, John and I started uh, talking about our common interest in Mike Kelly. And uh, he told me that he'd been working with his students uh, on some of his uh, concepts and especially around uh, the sculptural piece called Educational Complex. So uh, I told John about um, this book, uh, written by John Miller called The Educational Complex, in which uh, John Miller uh, singles uh, the Educational Complex out as uh, a turning point within Mike Kelly's career. So uh, there is a before and an after, The Educational Complex. So I thought that uh, for today it was a very good idea to um, explain how my study arrives to the educational complex and to see how the major works that he produces between the educational complex in 1995 and uh, his decease in 2012 uh, are all branching out from this uh, sculptural piece. So uh, basically, in other words, we're going to trace the conceptual continuity of his work and uh, also to see the evolution of his uh, symbolic language. So I'm pretty sure that uh, all of you who've ever heard about uh, Mike Kelly know uh, this kind of work. So the plush toys, the, the works that he did with plush toys. And uh, of course, well, this is the ultra-famous cover of the album Dirty by Sonic Youth, very uh, significant for people of my generation, not so much for uh, young people. You also can see a little Mike Kelly there among the, uh, the little plush toys. So uh, the first thing that I want to say is that uh, nowadays it's uh, very common to see this kind of materials uh, directly extracted from popular culture in galleries. So. Uh, you will always see some artists in some gallery that is working with this kind of materials. But uh, it was not until pioneers like Mike Kelly or uh, Jeff Koons or Heinz Steinbach who were using this kind of materials. And of course many people in the beginning uh, categorize it as a pop, as pop art. But uh, I'd like to make a very clear distinction between uh, how pop uses popular imagery and how Mike Kelly uses it. Because in pop, if you think, for example, of the Campbell Soup or uh, of Marilyn Monroe's face or whatever, you can basically project any kind of meaning that you want. 
So uh, you can either consider it a glorification of a popular culture as much as um, uh, a critique of consumer culture. Because uh, for pop, these kind of materials are basically a surface. And this is the exact opposite to how Mike Kelly uses this kind of material. Because uh, Mike Kelly thinks that uh, these kind of materials are charged with meaning. So it's the opposite of being an empty surface, it's charged with meaning. And he's always analyzing this kind of subtle relationships between how uh, these materials are formed and their use. So uh, he uses them because they're very pre-given. So what this means is that, uh, for example, uh, especially in um, university or in academia, we're very conscious about text. So in text, we're always able to think in terms of the structure and we can analyze the power relations within the text and so on. But are we ever so analytic when uh, it comes to uh, materials from popular culture or these little plush toys and so on? So uh, he thinks that we're not so analytic and that there's a kind of um, almost uh, like an anthropological image of, uh, of ourselves and of society that can be seen in these materials that are generally not analyzed. So uh, here you see uh, the tapestry, more lovers love hours than can ever be repaid, um, which uh, actually uh, was referring to the economy of the gift. So anyway, I don't have time to to explain that, but uh, just so you know that there is a, a very cerebral kind of reflection uh, behind these materials. So that he was looking at these materials from a very, very analytic point of view. But uh, to his surprise, people were not looking at these materials from this uh, analytical mindset, but always from a very sentimental point of view. So uh, people were understanding that uh, he used these materials uh, because uh, he was making a reference to childhood, and especially to his own childhood, and probably because he had been abused as a child. So uh, he started producing works like this one, Graph Morphology Flow Chart, uh, underlining uh, that it, this is an analytical work. So uh, for example, you see that uh, here he set the plush toys on top of tables, and uh, he photographed them with rulers and so on, which are uh, standards of investigation, like uh, standards of uh, archaeology or of police investigations. So just to give a hint to the public that uh, it really is an um, analytic work and that uh, maybe they shouldn't uh, project so much sentimentality on them. But. Um, the work uh, kept being uh, interpreted uh, as a reference to childhood and especially to childhood abuse. So uh, we have to frame this kind of uh, projection, this kind of uh, interpretation uh, in the light of abuse and trauma. Uh, at the end of the 1980s and the beginning of the 1990s in the United States, at the height of what was called uh, repressed memory syndrome. So repressed memory syndrome was, um, it was a pop interpretation of the theories on repression developed by Freud like a hundred years before. So uh, at the end of the 19th century, Freud um, postulated a theory that said that uh, if you suffer a traumatic experience, uh, you will not remember it. You will repress it in your unconscious because that information uh, would shatter your identity. It's so powerful uh, that it, it would make you crazy. So um, the, this was the theory and for a hundred years nobody's thinking about this. So nobody's investigating this, nobody is writing any papers or uh, there are no um, experiments on this, but suddenly um, at the end of the 80s in the United States, uh, you have all these cases everywhere, like uh, the media is trumpeting these cases of people who are recovering memories uh, of having been abused. And uh, strangely, uh, these memories are always recovered 
in so-called therapy uh, performed by uh, quacks. So uh, basically, people who never studied psychology or um, anything, basically, but somehow uh, got into the position that they were considered therapists, and they claimed that they could extract these uh, hidden memories of abuse from uh, the so-called victims. So um, it was actually uh, much more than uh, an anecdote because even the, the legal framework of the United States was changed because uh, I mean, generally if you want to uh, take somebody to justice, you need to have some kind of proof. But uh, during this decade, the, the law was changed so that you could, um, if you had recovered a memory of this uh, abuse, so uh, 30 years later and you had no proof, uh, you could accuse your grandpa or uncle or whoever and throw this person to jail without ever having any evidence. So it was really something that was uh, like a social phenomenon. It was very, very important. Mm -hmm. And uh, suspiciously, all these uh, memories that people were recovering and that were telling them on TV and in uh, newspapers and magazines and so on, always responded to three mythologies. So um, people had always been, what they remembered, or the, the kind of memories that they suddenly had of what ha had been going on was uh, either that uh, people had been abused in an incest scenario, or um, by aliens, or uh, in, in a satanic ritual with animals and so on. So uh, just the fact that uh, there were these three kind of mytho mythologies perfectly defined, uh, and people always remember the same, is uh, like a great indication that there was something fishy going on. So um, the most important case uh, that most shook the imagination of the uh, American public was the McMartin preschool case. So uh, it was, I think it was 1986, that uh, the head of the school, uh, Virginia McMartin, and uh, some other teachers were accused of abusing the children of the school in tunnels that were underneath the preschool, in satanic rituals, involving uh, sex with animals and so on and so forth. So um, this was huge, it was uh, enormous and everybody was horrified and there were like a hundred million uh, magazine articles and uh, people, you know, everybody was, uh, so it was incredible. And uh, the gentleman here that you see with the cowboy hat is a policeman. They conducted these excavations looking for um, for the tunnels where the abuse allegedly had taken place. But, oh, surprise, surprise, they didn't find anything. So the case had to be closed. And uh, this is important, you will see later why. So um, uh, Mike Kelly's conclusion was that uh, this idea of uh, victim, uh, trauma, uh, repressed memory syndrome, etc., that this was far more than an anecdote. That it was actually a, a social paradigm. It was uh, something that was defining contemporary society. So as much as in the symbolist period there was this idea of natural law, and in modernism we have like technological utopia, uh, in contemporary society uh, we have victim culture. So according to Kelly, our mythos, so the founding mythos of our society, is that we want to see ourselves as victims. So. Um, he says, okay, um, instead of uh, running away from this idea with my art, I'm going to embrace it. I'm going to embrace the social role that people are putting on me of being a victim. Uh, so I'm going to uh, become a victim, but not an, a, a familial victim, but an aesthetic victim. So his idea is, okay, everybody's seeing that I have been abused. Uh, as an artist, because my work obviously sh shows signs of abuse. So uh, I'm going to explore this abuse taking the position of the victim, but not of uh, a familial victim, but an, an artistic or aesthetic victim. So um, then he produces the educational complex. 
So uh, the educational complex is basically going to be uh, a model that uh, is intending to uh, symbolize the zeitgeist of this time, so victim culture and repressed memory syndrome. But uh, physically, it's um, a model of all the educational institutions uh, that Kelly ever attended with the parts that he didn't remember left blank. So corresponding with the idea of the repressed memory syndrome, that there are parts of your memory that you cannot access. So the memory is represented by the buildings, and the parts that he doesn't remember are left blank. So buildings, you have his home, his church, uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. You have uh, California Institute of the Arts. You have everything. And um, of course, this symbolic architecture, metaphoric architecture, is connected to, uh, to utopian architecture. So uh, in case you don't know what utopian architecture is, I'm referring to um, the kinds of uh, projects developed by architects like uh, Le Corbusier or, or Paolo Arcosanti Soleri or, or Rudolf Steiner that you're seeing here uh, in the image. This is the Vete Anum. That was uh, a very important piece. It was a very important building for, for Kelly because, um, uh, well, normally architecture is built uh, according to functionality. And uh, the constructive principles of the Geteanum, for example, are uh, metaphorical. So the constructive principles are um, the meta, uh, metaphysical principles of uh, the anthroposophy, which was the, the philosophy developed by Rudolf Steiner. And also, Kelly was interested because of that, and he was also interested in the fact that uh, Steiner conceived it as a Gesamtkunstwerk, so as a total work of art. So um, the, total work, the idea of the total work of art comes from Wagner, and it's a union of all the arts. So inside this building, there's going to be uh, painting, there's going to be dance, theater, etc. So all the arts come together uh, to, in, in a mirror of that kind of philosophy. And uh, Mike Kelly is going to try to do the same. So, uh, of course, buildings like the Geteanum were a model for the ideal man. So uh, Rudolf Steiner wanted to make a model to emulate to become perfect. That was the idea of the utopian architects. So to create an architecture that would create the perfect man. But of course, uh, Kelly was not building uh, the perfect idealized architecture he was doing kind of the opposite. So it was kind of negative utopian architecture. So uh, it's not the architecture of the ideal man, it's uh, the architecture of contemporary consciousness, which is not a utopia, but the opposite. It's a dystopia, because people want to consider themselves as victims. And this is exactly what Kelly wants to symbolize. And as constructive principles, he uses repressed memory syndrome and the Hans Hoffmann push-pull theory. So repressed memory syndrome, I already told you. So you have these buildings that uh, symbolize uh, memory, and you have these blank blocks that symbolize the parts of the memory that cannot be accessed because they had been repressed because of repressed memory syndrome. OK, so that's one constructive principle. And the other constructive principle is the Hans Hoffmann push-pull theory. So Hans Hoffmann was, um, was a very important uh, abstract expressionist. I suppose that uh, all you Americans probably know Hans Hoffmann. So he was very, very influential, influential in the post-war period. And um, you see that uh, the push-pull theory is basically uh, a way of trying to balance out certain tensions in the painting. So as you see here in the painting, in the image, the, the background is pure chaos. It's uh, undifferentiation. There's something uh, confusing going on. And in the foreground, you have this geometry. So uh, this, using this as a constructive principle that you can see in the order of the volumes of the educational complex, is a way in which Kelly is saying, okay, 
it has been my education. It's been my education that has been my trauma. So this is why this is my city of trauma, because my education has been my pure, my real trauma. Okay, so at the same time that uh, Kelly was producing the educational complex, he was doing this work. It's called Timeless Author List. So, okay. I know it's kind of complicated, but you will see it all in the end. So, uh, we said that uh, the parts of the buildings that he didn't remember were left blank. Okay, so what was going on in those parts? Abuse, okay? So what he wants to do with this work is to tell little stories of the abuse that had taken place in, in the blank blocks. So what he does is that he starts out from uh, something that happened to him, and then he replicates one, one of these kinds of scenarios that I told you about. And that people were saying that they were remembering that they had been abused by aliens or that uh, they had been abused by somebody in their family or so on. So, for example, he would start out, he was uh, an Irish Catholic, so he would start out by saying something like, uh, I was going to uh, church one morning, and then he would uh, add this uh, fantasy of uh, abuse. So, I was going to church uh, one Sunday morning, and uh, I was raped by a gang of uh, aliens, or something like that. So, he was creating these uh, little stories of abuse. So that was one part, and the other part is uh, the images that you see, uh, the photographs, which are found photographs of uh, what Kelly called carnivalesque activities, which were um, photographs of uh, people, so students basically, um, from high schools that were uh, doing activities that they would normally not do in the institutional framework. So he wouldn't choose photographs of like the students uh, in class. He would uh, choose photographs of the students in the student play or um, in Halloween or something like that. So he brought together these two elements. So uh, his stories that he created of uh, fictional abuse and also this carnivalesque activities. And uh, he displayed them as a newspaper. So basically the story here is that, um, well, newspaper is associated to telling the truth. So, uh, well, at least it should be. Uh, so the idea here is that um, we live our own memory or we think of our own memory as something truthful. So as something that uh, happened in reality. But actually what Kelly says is that uh, in your memory, uh, so real events and fictional events have the same level of psychic reality. So that's the idea. Ah, and here, so uh, this is a piece that is drilled underneath the educational complex, okay? So if you see here, this was the, the first time that the, the educational complex was displayed. There is a little mattress underneath the educational complex. So you can actually crawl underneath the educational complex and lie down in the mattress, and this is what you see. So this is the basement of CalArt, which was one of the uh, institutions where he studied. And here you see very clearly those blank blocks that uh, I was talking to you about. And of course, this piece is very important because it allows us to see uh, how Kelly's symbolic language works. So for Kelly, everything that is underground uh, refers to the unconscious. And everything that is above ground refers to a super ego, refers to the social facade, refers to rational thinking. Okay, so he uh, creates a, a parallel between uh, this basement of Carl Arts and the tunnels underneath the McMartin preschool. So uh, the idea is that, of course you can say, but uh, the McMartin preschool didn't have any tunnels. They looked for them and they were not there. So this is the idea. The idea is that uh, the tunnels underneath the McMartin preschool are a symbol for Kelly. They're a symbol of uh, a fictional creation of, uh, that responds to a social desire. So it's a social desire to be a victim. So 
the tunnels underneath the McMartin Preschool <coughs> and the California uh, Institute of the Arts basement are the same space, which are the space of the unconscious. And here, for example, in uh, this other installation, so it's, uh, this is the entrance to the, uh, the installation, the trajectory of light in Plato's cave. Kelly is asking of the, uh, of the viewer that if he wants to see, he has to, you know, get dirty. He has to uh, crawl on the floor and uh, uh, go on, you know, in an almost humiliating position. It's a very playful and uh, it is humiliating and it's also almost like a sexual game. Because basically the, the idea here is that uh, Okay, if you want to go a little bit beyond in, in art, beyond the super ego, beyond the nice picture, you have to be prepared to uh, experience art in another way. So you're entering the space of fantasy, you're entering the space of the unconscious, and this is not a pretty place. No, this is a place that is going to give you an image of yourself that probably is not so comfortable. So, uh, and it's also, so it's the space of the unconscious, which is the space where, uh, of course, the repressed memories are, but it's also the, the space of, of desire, the space of sexuality. Uh, and, um, of course, the space of sexuality that has not been controlled or encumbered by, by society, by social regulation. So that's why, symbolically, you have to crawl on the floor, because you're entering another space. And here, this piece, if you see, it's exactly the same structure. So again, it's a reference to the basement of Cal Art, which is the tunnels under the McMartin Preschool, which is the unconscious. Okay, and we see here, this is a, another time that the installation was uh, in, uh, I don't remember exactly, I think it was in Switzerland. So again, you see a tunnel. So Michael is once again asking you as viewer, so if you want to see, you have to get on all fours and you have to crawl, okay? So you have to crawl and uh, at the end of the little tunnel that you see here, there's a tin box, which is actually an uh, anal probe, uh, probe uh, alien cabin. So once again, it's a reference to those three mythologies that I was talking about. So uh, abused by aliens. And of course, there is this very uh, symbolic element uh, in this installation, which is this pink resin. So uh, the use of the color pink, again, not so much nowadays, but uh, in the time where, when Kelly was doing this kind of work, um, pink was not used in fine arts, because fine arts should be about the universal and about very high um, things and, uh, you know, you, you, can't, you couldn't use a color which was as unserious as pink, because pink was associated to girls and uh, to decoration and so on, so you couldn't actually use pink. So the use of pink is a provocation. but. Uh, of course, it's a provocation because we're entering that space of provocation. We're entering that space of the unconscious, which is at the same time alluring and dangerous. So here, several metaphors that bring us to the space of the unconscious. So this pink resin is almost like a diode because you have this very uh, dull and boring plywood structure, but it Inside there is this secret space, which is full of wonder, and which is very sensuous. So you almost want to lick it. And of course, Michael refers to this uh, installation as a macrogenital structure. So it's also a reference to uh, the inside of a uh, human orifice, like uh, a vagina or something. But uh, Kelly refers to this in his text. He, he talks about pornography referring to uh, this piece. So then this is uh, established the, the space of the unconscious. A place of wonder, a place of sensuality, and a place of wilderness. So okay, so this is bringing all together. So uh, you have there uh, 
in the upper part you have a, a painting by Hans Hoffmann. And if you imagine that you turn it 180 degrees, you have, and you, you build up the volume, you have the geometry on top or in the foreground, and in the background or underneath, you have chaos. So uh, in the upper part, you have geometry, you have super ego, uh, you have uh, social regulations, you have education, you have all these castrating rules that society puts on people to become adults, to become part of society. And underneath, you have chaos, you have undifferentiation, you have the space of the unconscious, which is wild and which is related to repressed memory syndrome. It's where the repressed memories are. So the next um, work I wanted to talk about is the, the series that uh, Michael did around Candor. So uh, what I want to say is that uh, the work that he did with Candor uh, is saying exactly the same as educational complex, but to a broader audience. So with uh, different reference, but the topics are the same. So um, basically, uh, well, everybody knows the, the figure of Superman. Uh, and this is why Kelly chose him. Because, uh, of course, the buildings of his own education were something that he knows about. But if you want to appeal to a broader audience, you can also use a, a reference that is known to all, like Superman. So. Um, Kelly uh, refers to a particular episode of uh, the life of Superman, which is uh, the explosion of his planet of origin, which was Krypton, and uh, that supervillain Brainiac shrunk his city, his hometown, Kandor, into a bell jar. So uh, Superman is left to safeguard uh, his own city of trauma for eternity in his fortress of solitude. And of course, it's like a permanent reminder of his uh, psychic alienation towards the rest of the people on the planet. Because of course, he's the best man, he's Superman, but uh, he's actually not a man. He's an alien and he feels alone, and so on and so forth. And of course, the bell jar becomes a symbol of that uh, psychic disconnection. And uh, here, this is a still from a video in which Superman appears uh, doing exactly what the title says. So he's reciting sections from the bell jar and uh, other works by Sylvia Plath. So uh, I guess uh, as most of you are American, you all know Sylvia Plath. But in case somebody doesn't know her, uh, she was an incredible American writer. Uh, who died in very tragic circumstances, so she became an icon of disaster and, and so on. But her first novel, that was an autobiographical novel, was called The Belger. And in it, uh, the protagonist describes uh, in a very intelligent and sensitive way how she gets distant from the world and she falls into her own depression and then wants to commit suicide. So she says that uh, being depressed is like looking at the world through the distorting lens of a bell jar. So Kelly is actually establishing a parallel between Sylvia Plath and Superman, which is also very interesting in terms of gender bending and so on. But of course, it's also very interesting if we consider educational complex. So candor is to Superman what educational complex is to Kelly. So they're both the cities of trauma, they're both the, the symbols of uh, alienation, uh, and they're both a permanent reminder that uh, they will uh, always be eternally distant from what is around because they have that trauma. That's what trauma creates. So this is one of the ways in which Kelly was uh, using the metaphor of candor, but he also used it to symbolize that memory is elusive. So actually, all the, um, so, uh, the comics of Superman were drawn by different people. And each uh, draftsman uh, was uh, drawing the city of Kandor in a different way. 
So Kelly says that, uh, well, he uses it as a, a metaphor of the elusiveness of memory. He says that there is, it's not possible to find, uh, to find a final representation of the city of Kandor because Kandor is a city of memory and memory is always a work in progress. So memory is not like a book that you go 20 years later and it's the same book. He says that as long as you keep on living, your memory keeps on changing. So he uses this idea, you see here in, the, in his exhibition, Candor Con 2000, uh, he, he had some architecture students, you see a little student there, who were working on building uh, different uh, installations of uh, the city, so uh, little buildings, and they were working on it throughout the run of the exhibition, just to show that uh, memory never finds a final representation because it's changing all the time. And yeah, so with this idea that you cannot, uh, that you cannot find a final representation of memory, he produced a great number, actually 20 different versions of the city of Kandor, just to underline the fact that you never find a final representation. Okay, so the next work that I, I wanted to tell you about is uh, extracurricular activity projected reconstruction. So um, some of you might have heard about The Day is Done because it was a huge project that he did in Gagosian Gallery composed of, I think it was 20, 20 video installations in, in Gagosian Gallery that were all synchronized and so on. And um, to speak about this work, let me return for a second here. Here. If you remember, I told you that uh, at the same time that he was producing uh, the educational complex, he was uh, doing this work in which he created little stories of, uh, of abuse that supposedly happened in the blank blocks of educational complex. So what he did in extracurricular activity projective reconstruction was the same but in video form. So he created videos of uh, alleged abuse that had taken place in the blank blocks of educational complex. So actually, extracurricular activity projective reconstruction uh, is, um, is uh, actually completing this idea of the Gesamtkunstwerk that, that I told you before. So he already had the architecture the traumatized architecture of educational complex and then in these videos he's gonna add up everything else so uh, theater, dance, um, painting, poetry, everything so all the arts come together and uh, therefore he completes uh, educational complex as a Gesamtkunstwerk through this work and the strategy that he followed was uh, a little bit also emulating, again, sorry, 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 emulating what happened here. So he would choose one of these images of a carnivalesque activity. He would replicate the, um, the, the kind of things that were going on in the photograph, in this found photograph, and then he would write a script of what was going on. You know, so here, for example, in the simplest one, which is the first one. Uh, underneath, you have these uh, two guys, the, the blonde and the brunette. The, uh, to the left, you have the original photograph. Um, so this must have been like a school play or something like that. And you have the blonde and the brunette, the filthy apartment. So uh, what the Kelly does is replicate the same scene. You have the blonde, the brunette, the filthy apartment, and he builds up a narrative. So in his narrative, uh, so the brunette is uh, criticizing the blonde for being a sissy and la 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 and uh, uh, Sylvia Plath, well her ghost appears and so on and so forth. So but basically that is uh, the way that he operates. And in the next videos, so in the rest of the videos that uh, compose extracurricular activity, blah, 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 uh, he does the same but bringing together several of these uh, found photographs. So here, these are some girls that uh, make a, they're, they're part of all the videos of Day is Done, and they're doing a chaga chaga train uh, around Cal Art. So again, it's a return to the scene of crime. 
So if you see, so it, it was kind of complicated, but everything makes sense. So it's like a puzzle in which all the pieces come together. So here you have the found photograph of a student uh, dressed like a vampire, and Kelly replicates it. And also that's a piece with a lonely vampire who is singing in a um, Andrew Lloyd Webber uh, musical way. And here you have one of the video installations at, um, at Gagosian. And uh, yeah, this is the last project uh, that I'm going to tell you about. And it was also Mike Kelly's last project. It was called the Mobile Homestead. And it was a replica of his childhood home. So uh, obviously, if we're talking about education, education being traumatic, uh, all these references, of course, the, the childhood home would be like the ground zero of abuse. Okay. So uh, in, in the beginning, he wanted to, sorry, he wanted to use his own home, so the, the home that his parents owned when he was growing up, but um, the person who owns the home doesn't wanna, didn't want to sell it to him. So he had to team up with uh, the MOCAD, the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit, and uh, another institution called uh, Art Angel, and uh, make a work of public art. So you see here, there is this replica on the grounds of the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit, and the front can be put on a trailer, and it actually goes to the, the parents' home and back to the museum. So in the beginning, the original piece wanted to keep uh, the exact same uh, uh, symbolic structure. So it wanted the buildings above ground to be, again, super ego, and the buildings below ground to be uh, the space of fantasy, the space of uh, freedom, the space of wilderness, the space of trauma, the unconscious. OK. so. Um, the original project referred to uh, a familial superego. Okay, so what was expected from uh, a family like his uh, in the 60s, in a suburb, in Detroit, etc. So that was the, uh, the initial idea. And uh, he thought about building these tunnels underneath the house that would take to several places in Detroit, like Brace Burgers, for example. So you, you can almost imagine Kelly uh, as a young uh, man, so being told off by the parents, super ego, super ego, and he would maybe imagine to, so this kind of escape fantasies of being able to go through a system of tunnels somewhere else where he wanted to be, raised burgers, for example. So um, he couldn't do this because he couldn't use uh, his original home, so uh, he did it as a an art um, as a public art project. And of course, he wanted to keep the same structure symbolically, but he turned from uh, being a familial thing, so referring to his family as super ego, to the super ego of art, to the super ego of the art world. Okay? So, and actually, there's nothing that's more politically correct than public art within art. Is if you want to um, ask for money for a public project, you kind of have to promise that you're going to be you know, making the community better and so on. So actually, um, this building in Detroit is used as a community gallery. And uh, this part that goes on a trailer and so on is also used like a movable library and uh, so it dispenses blood and stuff like that. So good deeds for the community. And uh, the thing is that it's not that Kelly suddenly became a philanthropist. is that he was doing a comment on the superego of art. And uh, underneath, uh, he built a system of tunnels um, that were very confusing and that, were, that are not public. They're not for public use. So on top, you have superego. You have super good deeds for the community. But uh, in the underground, you have uh, this space that uh, was uh, designed to uh, be for uh, activities of an antisocial and artistic nature. And I'm quoting Kelly here. OK, so that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. I know there was. <laughs> Uh, 
after um, like a public became more familiar with the work of Mike Kelly, did the discourse around this kind of like psychological theory of repressed memory change in an overall public? Because like at, you, in that example you showed at first, they were taking these accusations very literally from people who were experiencing repressed memory and taking these fantasies of satanic animal molestation and child molestation to a literal level where they're actually literally digging for tunnels and looking for tunnels. And the way that you say that Mike Kelly kind of like shows like the place of these symbols in our, in our, in our psyche and our conscious and our way that we rep repress our abuse and we establish our victimhood. Um, did that kind of get translated across to a more psychological community when they're going, wait a minute, maybe we should take these um, reports of victims and these testimonies and kind of begin to uh, pull them apart a little the way that Kelly is suggesting? No, actually it was um, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Loftus mainly who uh, was responsible of debunking the myth of uh, false memory. So uh, what she did was uh, prove that uh, actually it's not that easy. So there's no evidence that a repressed memory syndrome uh, ever existed or ever was at work. But actually what is uh, proved and what she proved with uh, a lot of tests, and you can look at, it, at this online and so on because she made like millions of tests, it's very easy to implant false memories. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy to make people think that something that didn't happen, happened. So um, she did it. And uh, for a very long time, uh, she, she was like the devil speaking of Satan. So um, really, because it, it was very, uh, so, you know, everybody was horrified with this kind of stories. Mm -hmm. And it, it was something very new. So n nobody knew about it, and it was taken as science, you see? So people thought that really, I mean, there were really victims and so on. And these people were victims, but they were victims of quacks, you know? Mm -hmm. So they, they were not victims of abuse, or maybe yes, but we don't know. Mm -hmm. So. Um, uh, Elizabeth Loftus was uh, taken as an uh, expert um, witness uh, of uh, the people who were falsely accused. And she was receiving death threats, so it was terrible for her. But uh, in the end, it, it was proved that she was right. So uh, actually, it did get to, to the psychological community or to the psychological experts. But uh, I don't think that it was through Mike Kelly's work. Mm -hmm. Did anyone feel that offended by this work, like that he was trying to kind of sensationalize these kind of like false theories of repressed memory and like this own authorship of trauma and this own kind of like narrative of trauma that he had that was very personal and kind of like leave it up in the air deliberately to kind of like advance his own kind of like status as an artist? Did you ever receive a critique like that? Uh, not that I know of, but uh, of course, I mean, uh, as you have seen, uh, Michaelis' work is kind of uh, labyrinthine. Mm -hmm. It's very, very difficult to understand. It's very complex. So basically, I don't think that people could really make that kind of criticism because the the, the ideas that Michaelis was tackling were far too complex. So people would go to an exhibition and see, ah, nice uh, model, you know, they wouldn't mm -hmm. be thinking what's behind. So I don't think that there was ever that kind of criticism. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Yeah? This uh, underground site for artistic expressive activities, is it being used? I hope is so. This, have you seen, is it, how does I, one uh, participate in subversive underground activities in, in this for private? Yeah, uh, so actually it's, uh, it's kind of sad because, uh, well, I don't know if you know, but uh, Mike Kelly committed suicide. And uh, the same day that uh, he committed suicide, he signed uh, the papers so that uh, this work was completed. So um, it was his intention, so he wrote about it. He said, I want this to be a place where this kind of activities are taking place. But of course, this is handled by the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit. I've asked people who have visited it, nobody knows exactly. And uh, also, uh, it's a really cool idea to, to have these tunnels and so on. 
but people who have visited it, actually John Miller told me that he had seen the tunnels and that uh, he, he didn't think that no artist could work there, you know, because it's completely dark and uh, really not, not a nice place to be in. So uh, I don't know if it works more, but even if it's only as an idea, so if, if it's a construction that works only in the mind, I think it's still very interesting. And the, and the, the third, the, the even lower level there? Yeah, no, so it's... Um, is that, I mean, that, I'm assuming that the, the middle level is the subversive artistic activity and the, the lowest level is the secret tunnels to somewhere. No, no, they're, they're both... So uh, the thing is that uh, you cannot, in the second level, you cannot enter from one room to the next. You have to go down and then up and then in another place and so on, so it's to lose completely your, your sense of orientation. I actually had a question, yeah. or I, maybe not so much a question, but um, had been considering a lot of Mike Kelly's work, which I have to be honest, I don't know all of it, and I, I kind of really enjoy savoring each one I come to learn about, and um, because, like you mentioned, they are, they are so complex, but um, having finished, read the John Miller book, and thinking more about also the relationship to Freud, um, simultaneously, I, I became more aware uh, recently of, of Freud's nephew, Eddie Bernays, who was really one of the, the, the um, main pioneers of Freud, or at least popularizing him in America at a time where he had just um, moved over there. And for those who don't know Eddie Bernays, he was actually the guy who more or less invented public relations and so much of what happens in terms of the influence of the media or more, more so marketing is attributed to the influence of Eddie Bernays, which has an interesting connection, of course, when you think of the subconscious effect, the subversive effects that advertising has today, which you know we're all totally surrounded by. Would you say that just in terms of the research you've done and what we know of Kelly's work, like to what degree perhaps Kelly subscribed to these ideas that were Freudian? Because he refers to them quite deeply, but like, could you imagine that he was really a believer in a lot of the theories that were Freudian? <laughs> or is this still kind of, is this concept up for grabs to a degree? No, uh, I mean, uh, Kelly uh, liked Freud very much, but he liked Freud uh, especially because Freud was a fantastic writer. So uh, Kelly enjoyed those kind of theories very much. I mean, to what extent uh, he, he believed that, uh, I mean, he took uh, Freud's uh, theories literal, literally, I mean, Nobody nowadays takes uh, Freud's uh, theories literally. Mm -hmm. you know, so this was part of the problem with the repressed memory syndrome. So uh, the idea of uh, you know, repressing uh, memories that are traumatic and so on, like all of Freud's theories, are, is interesting. So, uh, and for an artist, uh, this kind of, uh, of ideas are, are very, I mean, you can extract, you can get a lot of, it's very juicy mm -hmm. for an artist. But of course, uh, we have to take them as metaphors. And uh, in, in Kelly's case, I, I think he was very interested. Uh, Kelly was super well read. Th this is something that is uh, amazing because still today I, I hear about Kelly that he was this kind of anti-intellectual mm -hmm. artist and you know the artist who loved popular culture and so on and it, it's not true. So Kelly was, uh, you know, he, he, he had this erudition about many things. So um, he knew uh, uh, Freud's work very well. But um, I, I don't think that he was a, a believer in a literal sense mm -hmm. of, of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of these works by Kelly seem to do involve like a confinement of the body and like a loss of orientation and direction in relation to your environment. I was wondering how, if you know anything about how they informed like the curatorial choices that were made with mm -hmm. Mike Kelly's work, like how a curator of his work might choose how a visitor would encounter it and how they would lose themselves inside it? Well, here, for example, uh, it, it was not open to the public, mm -hmm. you know, so um, I, I think of it more, uh, it's almost a, a conceptual work, you know, like uh, something to be thought about, so more like a, a structure to be thought about, that, uh, something that you really have to experience, you can already experience it with your mind. You know, so uh, n no, so it, and this was n never curated because it's not open to the public. 
So this but, house. His house, yes. This house is not open to the public. The upper part. The upper the, part. The building uh, above ground, which is a community gallery. What about the massive version of educational complex with the pink geode interior? Mm -hmm. Like, do you know anything about how it was chosen to be displayed? Because I imagine that you would, if I were to curate that work, I want the audience to enter a very specific place and not be able to leave until they've kind of become lost inside of it. Yeah, no, I, I don't think that uh, Mike Kelly wanted to control the, the public in that sense. So basically, he's leaving it open for you. So here, we have the tunnel. So this uh, tunnel of the unconscious and so on that I, I was telling you about. So uh, it's there. If you want, you enter. If you don't, you don't. You know, and uh, I actually wouldn't. Because uh, in the end, you're going to end up in this uh, alien anal probe cabin. So uh, it's mm. also not. So, but um, it, I, I don't think he was uh, pressuring so much the, uh, the viewer. It's uh, only if you want. You know, he's opening the, the possibility. It's if you want to enter that space, you can do it. So, what do you want of art? Do you want to stay, stay in the part of the superego, or are you going to? get dirty, you know, so. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, because I feel like um, a lot of uh, his work is deeply, like, like um, related to his, abu like, the abusement, this symbolic, very symbolic idea. But I feel like maybe, like, one slide, I mean, if, for example, if we say about, like, a famous artist, and we say, like, so Donna is like um, mentally has mental disease, and Dango is also like mad. And how like how his own like personal characteristic or is like gossip like an antidote? Can we are we supposed to like integrate like his art? You know like how how can we just just we say like uh, his like education system like complex is the like how unhappy he is like when, sh when uh, during his like childhood or something like that you know i feel like it's not like very necessary to con like connect all of them to one childhood memory because as you say like memory is like evolving all the evolving all the time you know and he is also an artist mm -hmm. yeah i feel yeah yeah, so uh, basically, I think more than uh, based on, on his abuse, what uh, he was doing was analyzing the idea that we interpret uh, the, uh, the art of, uh, of the artist through this kind of ideas. You know, so um, it's also something that comes from romanticism, that we tend to interpret art uh, according to uh, the lives of the artist, and uh, this somehow uh, eclipses other kind of uh, analysis on the artworks. So um, I think that his uh, approach to, to abuse was in this sense uh, very analytic. So, and we don't know how much of his own memories and of his own abuse, if uh, it ever happened, he was using. You know, because for, for him, the important thing was that you understood that um, in your memory, uh, the things that really happened and your own fantasies, uh, and uh, of course your fantasies depend very much on the culture you live in, uh, are the same thing, so are at the same level of psychic reality. So I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, and I feel like you also mentioned like he's a good like storyteller. I feel like a good storyteller is also a good liar. I mean, mm -hmm. one has to be a good liar if he is a good storyteller mm -hmm. because I, I don't know like how that's related to like the like the symbolic abusement in his work, but maybe that could like explain like yeah. Maybe also thinking about that, there's a lot of provocation that happens. The, the, the implication of abuse is also the, the it seems to me at least the genesis of a lot of the um, concepts for especially something like educational complex. You know, like I don't remember it, so it must be uh, an abusive thing because 
of repressed memory syndrome. I mean, so you know, it's almost like creating, you know, these these rules and, and these, this this formula for um, uh, something that is the end, very very subjective, which could allow for lying or storytelling. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's the, the potential for that. I think. Or I think yeah, it's about a that. pure, it's pure lie. So. Uh, Mm. Sadly, I, I don't have. I, I would like to read to you some of these uh, um, remembered scenarios of abuse that he writes because they're, they're also they're hilarious. Mm -hmm. So they're about abuse, but they're so bizarre, like being raped by the hell's angels who were in the end Satan and the, uh, alien at the same time. You know, so mm -hmm. it, it was. The, there is a great deal of uh, creation. We actually don't know how much it was, you know, how close it was to his own biography. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe we take one last question, and then I would invite everyone for um, some refreshments, or I should say Bard will invite you for some refreshments outside. Lena, did you want to ask something? Yeah, I'm curious as to how much apprehension an uh, art historian or art theorist might feel in deconstructing Kelly's work when so much of what he was trying to do is like subverting any projection of meaning. So like where where would where does one go to in terms of trying to understand like a deeper meaning when that's exactly what he was trying to shy away from? Like are you is it was it mainly based off of literal words that he said or cuz that's a tricky situation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, that, that's a, actually a very good question. Yes, uh, Mike Kelly uh, wrote fantastically. He, he was, uh, uh, I mean, to me, of course, to me, uh, he was the, the best artist writer ever. He was amazing. And uh, please read his books. Read this book <laughs> and read Mike Kelly's books. They're absolutely amazing. And uh, for him, you see, he said that uh, if you don't write your own history, somebody else will. And this history will respond to their intentions. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, this is uh, exactly the point. Mike Kelly wrote so much, he wrote so many statements, he wrote, uh, I mean, his uh, works are collected and they're published by the MIT because they're, they're really something that it, it, it's fantastic. And uh, especially for, for you guys who are studying it. It, it's fantastic, and uh, the, the study that uh, I conducted was a study m based on his words. Because, uh, of course, it's not that some people accuse him of wanting to control how his work was seen. I don't see it that way. I see that uh, as an artist, and it would be interesting to see what your position as a young artist is, you know, uh, I don't think that he, he was trying to control. Uh, how people were seeing his work. I, I just think that he wanted to leave a testimony of what he thought, you know? And uh, of course, that doesn't mean that you cannot like it for other reasons, but uh, of course, there, there is his perspective. You know? So yeah, th that's a very, very fair and interesting question. And uh, yes, all, all the things that I have told you, you can read in his books. So Laura, thank you so much.